Hello everyone. The goal of this lesson is to introduce you to a set of concepts that will help make your scientific workflows and analyses more reproducible. To achieve this goal, we break down this lecture into a few learning objectives. First, we will review the concepts of reproducibility. We will then break down reproducibility of computational workflows into four different factors that influence it. We will understand both the need for and the problems with computational flexibility. We will see how data flow tools can help perform scalable and robust analyses, and then consider the impact of software changes on reproducibility. Finally, we will learn how to describe provenance and how to automate provenance tracking using some simple techniques. But let's start with reproducibility. As can be seen in this XKCD cartoon, there are many issues that have been brought up even in the context of popular media. And while one might look at the last of this list, control trials show Bunsen burners make things colder as being absolutely absurd and lead one to potentially believe that each of these titles are increasingly absurd statements about replication in science, it is the case that the first four titles are directly linked to scientific papers, whereas only the last one is an absurd extension by XKCD. To understand this issue with reproducibility, it might make most sense first to break down the notion of reproducibility. You've seen this figure before, and what we want to be able to do is to think about reproducibility from the context of both data and analyses, and break down the word reproducibility into four words, re-execution, replicability, robustness, and full generalization. While re-execution and robustness are looking at the dimensions of analyses, re-execution and replicability are looking at the dimensions of different kinds of data. And in the scientific world, all of us want to live in the full generalization space. That means anything we do or infer will be applicable to future data sets or analyses that are similar in nature to the original data set and original analyses. And one way to think about this is to think about what kinds of analyses and data sets might give rise to reproducibility. Well, there's a trivial and useless solution. If any analysis produced a specific constant like 42, you would satisfy all these four quadrants. Anytime you run something on the original data set with the original analysis, you get 42. You get a similar data set, you get 42. You get similar analysis, you get 42. And you get similar data set and similar analysis, you get full generalization. So just by having something that's a constant gives us full reproducibility, but that would not be very helpful. A more general case is where the answer is some kind of distribution. It's not a constant. And that this distribution depends on a bunch of different factors. And what's important is to understand that to truly evaluate reproducibility, what you might want to consider is what is your similarity function by which you say two things or two outcomes are similar. You may also want to think about how you want to disentangle the different components or sources of variance in creating that distribution that you're getting out of your analyses. And finally, one of the biggest veins of uh, reproducibility is an underspecification of conditions or requirements. We often run a very specific experiment and do a very specific analysis where things are very well controlled, but then we infer things that go beyond the extent of that specification. And that makes it harder to be generalizable. So one has to consider the specification as as much of importance in thinking about reproducibility as any of the other details of data and analyses. So let's now shift to the notion of a workflow. We can define a workflow as a set of tasks needed to achieve one or more goals. And some examples of generic workflows are a workflow used to purchase a car or cook a meal, construct a house, or even fly to New Zealand. In most workflows, tasks or processes have to be executed, sometimes in sequence and sometimes in parallel. But in all of these cases, one can kind of think of simplifying everything to this triplet of inputs, some activity, and some output. And you may have other activities that are part of an activity. But this kernel of inputs, activity, and output is a very useful concept to keep in mind as you're thinking of workflows. In the scientific domain, a scientific workflow might start from gathering information from participants, uh, the experimental design, the acquisition details. For neuroimaging specifically, we have a plethora of law, raw data that we might be able to gather from a participant. Then there are analyses and workflows and derived data that's generated from it. Uh, Finally, we get to publications, and lately, over the last 10 years, we've increasingly deposited both the results of workflows as well as raw data into various databases and services, so much so that today we might not even think about collecting data. 
and have a completely digital workflow that starts with data that has been distributed through databases, very much like the ABCD data set that you're playing with in this course. But we might consider looking at this through the lens of broad categories of scientific workflows. For example, testing a hypothesis. You might gather data, process data to generate derivatives, run statistical tests after you've generated those derivatives. You might want to establish replicability, gather two or more data sets, derive relation of interest in each data set, evaluate how similar the relations are. You might want to build predictive models, so you gather data sets with inputs and label targets. You might want to transform the data to perform feature engineering to get to features that might be easier to relate to your targets. You might evaluate or and build a predictive model. And finally, you might have a workflow that models systems. This might create a computational model. You might fit or evaluate the model to or on data. You might generate new predictions that you might then go back and test a hypothesis with or build other predictive models for. In all of these cases, this triplet of inputs, activity, and output remains in place. And if you were to stop watching this video, this would be a good slide after which you can stop, so, stop doing so. Well, at a very basic level, there are a set of common things that you can do to make your workflows and analyses more reproducible. First, use standards to describe information. You've already heard about BIDs and IDM. You can also start using common data elements that describe information in a consistent manner. You can use software that work with standards. There are various BIDs apps out there. There's a Reaper schema tool we have developed to collect data in a standardized format. You will want to write scripts that use and produce standardized data because then those scripts become reusable by others. And finally, you might want to consider how to develop well-defined similarity functions that are created a priori. And this is similar to creating a pre-registration. If you can define how you want to evaluate your scientific result, that becomes a building block for reproducibility. To make this more efficient, you will want to identify bottlenecks, for example, human interactions, uh, different types of protocols that may have human resources or other resources being intensively used. You also want to find sources of variation, things that you may not consider while you were thinking about your design or your hypotheses. For example, age, education, time of day. These things may have relations to the relationship that you are trying to observe, but you did not take into account as you were designing your experiment or thinking about testing a hypothesis. And finally, you want to track provenance. Being able to trust results means showing others how you did it and seeing what others did when you're looking at other people's results. So if you stopped right there, that would be okay. And if you could do all of those things that I described in the last slide, that would be fantastic. But here we will start now delving into various factors that influence computational reproducibility. The one factor we will leave off the table for now is the obvious one, data. But over the next sections, we will go through and describe what we mean by each of these terms and how they influence reproducibility of workflows and analyses. So let's start with computational flexibility. In the next few slides, we will cover what is computational flexibility? Why do we need computational flexibility? What are some issues with computational flexibility? And how can we reduce computational flexibility? So as an example, let's start with another XKCD cartoon. So this is an experiment where somebody comes and makes a hypothesis. Jelly beans cause acne, and scientists start investigating. And they find no link between jelly beans and acne. And somebody says, that settles that. While well, somebody says, oh, you did not take something into account. I hear it's only a certain color that causes it. So now they start experimenting with all the different colors of jelly beans that cause acne that may cause acne, and they find that there might be a link between the green jelly bean and acne. And that becomes the news flash: green jelly beans linked to acne. Now, there are many things that have not been taken into account over here uh, in terms of the number of tests they have done, the fact that they have found something, but it goes back to this notion of reproducibility. We have today a plethora of open software, and that's a good thing. This allows us to do many different analytics in different ways. 
and we have significant computational flexibility as a result of this open software. We find implementations of algorithms across these software, and each algorithm may take multiple parameters, so we can use those parameters to help us. There are many workflows that have been built using these software to do similar functions, like pre-processing, like brain extraction, and others. The software may run on various different operating systems, allowing us to use many different tools in many different settings, whether it's your HPC cluster or your laptop. And that gives rise to many different hardware platforms on which you might run these tools. But along the way, there are many decision-making steps that you have access to as well. You might have different decisions for thresholds on outliers. You might use certain thresholds when you're dealing with kids who might move a lot more in the scanner and you don't want to throw the data out. Or you might use a more stringent threshold uh, for adults who might move less. Which confounds to use becomes another aspect, especially in neuroimaging experiments. As a result, what you really have are many different things to choose from and many things to decide on. And this is what the computational flexibility allows you to use today. So why do we need computational flexibility? One of the issues is all tools are not robust to all inputs. There are few gold standard image processing operations and even those make mistakes on various inputs. Tools end up varying their output based on operating systems. As an example, we're looking at the volume of various subcortical structures that were labeled with FSL under different operating systems. Now, you would think that the same set of volumes labeled by the same software tool would all result in complete overlap across different operating systems. And you would get a dice coefficient which measures overlap across these volumes to be one. But what we see clearly over here is a variation of this dice coefficient value as a function of running the same tool on two different operating systems across a set of participants. In addition to variation that you might be getting from operating systems, many imaging questions do not have ground truth available for validation. For example, if you were looking at a diffusion pathway, there is no ground truth available to say this is the pathway that connected region A to region B. You infer it based on some proxy based on water diffusion in the brain. Different tools make a variety of different assumptions. For example, Three prominent tools that do fMRI analysis vary in their assumptions on their error models uh, at the first level and the second level or group level analyses. And these assumptions may result in differences you might observe in a particular analysis across these tools. We might also intentionally want to change the tool we use, for example, to optimize an application. Now, in this paper, they were looking at software differences that result in changes of age and gender prediction. But that might be a real application that you might have. And in this context, it might be better to choose one software over another because it gives you a better out-of-sample generalization of age and gender prediction. So while we may want to have computational flexibility, there are some issues with computational flexibility as well. We may enhance noise. Just like the experiment on jelly beans and acne, there's a chance that we will find something that is not there just by chance. And when we use computational flexibility and try out different things, we might find some results that may not exist. We may also choose methods in an ad hoc manner. Paper X from 2009 reported demonstrated that a method is the best, and we continue using it today, even though this has not been revalidated since 2009. And all the underlying software that support that method has changed over the last 10 years. You might say, I learned this in a course, and that's why I use it. So computational flexibility allows you to pick and choose certain things, and that's a problem in the context of reproducibility. You might find that the reason you use certain things is that your group has always used this approach and has been relatively happy with the outcomes of that approach. So the computational flexibility is not useful in this context because you have a very specific set of options that you have chosen that you have decided to live with. But what that results in is that we may often prefer results that conform with our expectations. And we need a better way of thinking about this process than just finding things that make sense to us. I'll bring in an example from a slightly different field. So on the left over here, what we are seeing is the value of the charge of an electron as it evolved over the last century. 
And on the right, we have a description from Richard Feynman talking about this change. It's interesting to look at the history of measurements of the charge of an electron after Millikan. If you plot them as a function of time, which is what this person did on the left, you find that one is a little bigger than Millikan's, and the next one is a little bigger than that, and the next one is a little bigger than that, until finally they settle down to a number which is higher. Why didn't they discover the new number was high right away? It's a thing that scientists are ashamed of, this history, because it's apparent that people did things like this. When they got a number that was too high above Millikan's, they thought something must be wrong, and they would look for and find a reason why something might be wrong. When they got a number close to Millikan's value, they didn't look so hard, and so they eliminated the numbers that were too far off and did other things like that. And this is something that's common in science. Our priors are quite strong, so we like things that are closer to our priors and discard things that are further away from our priors or try to move the needle such that those things that are further away are brought closer to our priors. And this is what computational flexibility allows us to potentially do. So how can we reduce computational flexibility? Obviously, it has issues, and it allows us to pick and choose things that we may not want to do. Well, there is no easy answer. The first thing is to embrace it. Uh, always perform multiverse analyses. And you might say, why should I be doing so? So here's an example from a paper that was published earlier this year when the same data set was analyzed by 70 different teams. What's shown over here and color-coded are significant voxels that were reported by all of the teams on a scale, the probability of it appearing in the analysis from all of the teams. So one would mean every team found this voxel. Anything below one would mean some of the teams did not. And as you can see, there's a fair bit of green in this, which means there was a small fraction of teams that found those voxels which means that there was a lot of variance across the teams in doing these analyses. Well, one of the reasons we have this is because there's computational flexibility and that different tools don't always behave in a similar manner given the assumptions that they were built with. So the next thing is to build more robust tools, but that will take time. We also want to move from hypotheses to computational models. If you actually had a model of how the system is supposed to behave, you could test against that model and keep refining that model as new observational data comes in that either agrees or disagrees with the model. You can work on creating validated workflows, and they are being created in various labs, but how one validates this still remains an open scientific question across various workflows, especially in neuroimaging. Finally, if you're building prediction models, you could try to optimize over the computational space. So instead of choosing a specific algorithm to do your machine learning, you might go across different methods and optimize over that set of methods. And for that, you might need more data, but that might allow you to reduce the computational flexibility of the approach to find more optimal solutions. So let's move from computational flexibility to tools that allow us to explore the space of tools. And these tools are called data flows. So first we'll kind of discover what are data flows. Then we'll think about what factors affect scalability and how data flow tools help perform scalable analyses. So we've already defined what a workflow is. And the way I'd like to try and distinguish between workflows and data flows is through the lens of computational workflows. So a generic workflow is one that may involve all kinds of interactions, uh, human interactions, human performed tasks, whereas computational workflows might focus on a set of tasks that involve computation, but there might be humans still involved taking decisions on some of these things. Data flows would be a subset of computational workflows that consume, transform, and or generate data towards achieving one or more goals without the need for human intervention. Specifically, tasks can get started whenever all the necessary input data are available for the task. And in general, data flows can be represented as computational graphs where data flows from nodes to other nodes. Each node performs a function. Most neuroscience analyses comprise multiple steps that are dependent on prior steps, i.e. they look like a graph. But neuroimaging analyses, for example, may involve pre-processing, quality control, normalization, and statistical inference. And since you have many different participants that you might process through these, these graphs might be replicated over participants or might be aggregated, for example, when you're doing statistical inference across a set of participants. You may also find that many software implement many of these algorithms. But the choice of these algorithms may be a function of performance. They vary in their execution time, output quality, and these might change as a function of sample characteristics, data quality, computational environments. Finally, you might choose your software based on whether you're trying to optimize something to find the best tool for the job or doing comparative analytics, which means you want to see how these vary 
as a function of the tool. For any given application, each software might bring with it a strength, set of strengths and weaknesses, and that might allow you to think about which software tools to use. Data flows enable abstraction, efficiency, and allow you to embed knowledge. They enable abstraction by encapsulating different functional tasks. Simplify the assumptions any individual tasks need to consider. It's like a function in a program. A data flow is simply a different computational object that implements a function. By allowing parallelization of processes and reduced overhead of data management, it increases efficiency. But by doing so, it also enhances replicability, where you can rerun the same data flow and expect some similarity of output as a result. Finally, data flows have become increasingly more complex in neuroimaging, imaging, but they get to embed knowledge. A data flow created today embeds the best practices. It embeds various kinds of heuristics that one might have discovered over the last two decades of doing functional imaging. And at the end of the day, because a data flow is like a function, it's a structured plan for analysis. So these are good for pre-registration. You've created a set of functions with a set of parameters that you might reuse. So it's easy to say, this is how I'm going to analyze the data. So you might ask, should I always use data flows? And my short answer to that is yes. And most of you are probably already doing so. But whether you end up using one data flow versus another might depend on a few things. Ease of replication. What I mean by that is that certain data flows might be complex to run. And you might not have the resources to run those things. Your goals and your use cases might be different. And in every context, you may not find a data flow that satisfies those goals or use cases. Computational dependencies and resources, I alluded to this earlier, might prevent you from running certain data flows. They might depend on a GPU, or they might require access to significant compute resources. They may be tied to a data management system. For example, if you're using Docker containers that were created for the XNAT pipeline system, they may not work in other contexts where you don't have access to XNAT storing your data. You may have a need for parameter exploration, which a specific data flow may not allow you to do easily. And finally, you might want to think about whether you're trying to repeat somebody's work or whether you're trying to compute different kinds of things using a data flow. And that might influence what kinds of data flows you end up using. One of the data flow engines that we have worked on over the last decade or so is called NiPipe. And it basically comprises of a workflow engine which can execute itself on different uh, underlying execution platforms but the main thing it provides is a uniform Python API that wraps around various neuroimaging tools. And here only three are shown, but we have access to over 700 tools from different packages that are accessible through a uniform Python API. This makes it much easier to construct complex data flows where you want to mix and match the optimal tools that go across uh, different packages uh, in order to satisfy a given application. Today, you have access to many different workflow systems. Some of these are general purpose and not specific to neuroimaging at all. And you might find them quite helpful because they satisfy some of those requirements of data flow tools. They allow you to manage complex workflows that involve computations. And some of them have been designed to be neuroimaging specific. And the top two, NiPipe and CPAC, are based on Python. Uh, the bottom two, Automated Analysis and SPM Batch, use MATLAB to do those analyses. And here, I've also listed a set of kind of more specialized data flows or workflow tools that are based on NiPipe. And you've probably heard of many of them, MRI QC, FMRI Prep, DMRI Prep, QSI Prep, Fitlins, Mindboggle, Lyman, and others. All of these tools allow you to both replicate analyses that somebody else is doing because you can use the same version of the tool. It also allows you to run an analysis without having to build these tools yourself. And as an example, here is part of the bold pre-processing data flow uh, from fMRI prep. And you can see it's a graph. Each graph has nodes and each node performs a specific set of tasks. A given node might get inputs from different outputs of other nodes and might send its outputs to different other nodes. And data flows achieve parallelization by looking at nodes that don't depend on each other and hence can be executed in parallel. By representing things as data flows, you get a significant level of efficiency out of using data flows in parallel processing, especially when you're going to run some of these things across a very large groups of subjects. So to summarize, data flows 
provide a few things. And it boils down to, again, this model of inputs, activity, and output. The separation of data, scripts, and execution. Data flows are not intricately tied to a particular data set. You can reuse data flows. So algorithms or data flows written using such abstractions can be used on different data sets. This is why you can run fMRI prep on every bits data set there is. Automation, data flows do not require human intervention, allowing automated execution. Now, there might be pieces between data flows where a human has to be involved, and you want to think about how to automate that more. But at least a data flow by itself does not require human intervention. Since data flows, well-constructed data flows can be applied to similar data, which itself encourages standardization. One of the key reasons I think BIDS has become popular, because it allows you to expect certain types, certain locations of data, and so you can write tools that can run on different data sets. Most data flow frameworks rely on language abstractions to support the flow of data, often without user consideration of naming files at different stages of a data flow. For those of you who have never used data flows, you probably do a lot of local management of naming of files across participants, across different processes and analysis steps. So what factors affect scalability of data flows? Efficient automation requires resources. You need humans to write scalable scripts and you need computational resources to run these scalable steps, scripts. Maybe the human part will go away in the next 10 to 20 years as AI does everything for us. But for the moment, uh, at least in the near future, you will need some level of human resources to write scalable scripts. Computing on 100 versus 10,000 versus 40,000 versus 100,000 can impact many choices when it comes to doing scalable analyses. And the diversity of this data, how many are going to not work in a, with a given data flow? things that you may not know ahead of time, all affect scalability of data flows. When it comes to data itself, it needs to be accessible to compute resources. In the ABCD study, yes, some of the derived data are accessible to the resources you have at hand. But if you had to download all the raw imaging data, that would require a significant amount of resources to have at hand. And in turn, it's not only storage, it's also bandwidth. It takes time to transfer data from node A to node B and that would affect the scalability of how fast you can run these data flows and where you might want to run it. So for ABCD, you might want to run them in the cloud where it's much faster to access data that's stored in the cloud than pulling all this data to your local resources. The efficiency and robustness of algorithms and tools become equally important in the context of data flows. Uh, just like we say a chain is as strong as its weakest link, the scalability of data flows depends on how scalable each individual tool might be. While you might get some level of scalability out of parallelization or embarrassing parallelization, not all tools are engineered for scale. So if one tool takes a long time to run, your overall data flow will be stymied by that one tool. And since we were looking at tools, one of the key elements in the context of reproducibility is how changes in these tools affect reproducibility. So you want to be able to be in a position to evaluate software changes and their potential impact. And the best place to start is not by studying other people's software, but by making sure that your own analysis scripts are well tested. But in the long term, one of the things you want to get to is how to improve trust in software itself. So let's start with a quote that has nothing to do with software per se. Not all, in fact, not even most of Teller's ideas are good. And he's the first, often the first to recognize their flaws, interrupting himself in mid-flight to strike himself on the forehead and exclaim, no, no, I'm an idiot. But mistakes do not inhibit him. He likes to quote dictum of Niels Bohr, the great Danish physicist, that an expert is a person who has found out by his own painful experience all the mistakes that one can make in a very narrow field. Teller succeeds not only by the high average level of his ideas, but by producing them in unparalleled volume, thereby making his mistakes rapidly and becoming more and more expert. And this is one of the fundamental properties with the computational flexibility that we have. Since not every tool is robust in every situation, you want to keep understanding when tools will fail. And one way to do so is to keep using them as much as possible. So you may ask, do I really need to know the implementation details of software? And I would say in the ideal world, if they work properly every single time, then maybe not. But in our current world, it may help to know a few things about the tools that you're using. What functionalities does the package implement? What platforms does it support? Is it tested on all platforms? Does it use stochastic approaches, for example, a random number generator, which means I might get a different result each time I run the software, or have to fix the random number generator to a given seed, which means every time I run it, 
I might get the exact same result on a given participant because every stage has been controlled, but I might want to know why they fixed it to one single seed. Uh, what would the variation be if I change that seed? What should I be looking for? Some simple things are, do the developers track changes? If you go to the GitHub repository for the software, can you see a list of changes that they have made between different versions? Are the changes tested? Uh, do they have tests for it? How complex are the workflow or software requirements? Well, there are trade-offs everywhere. More complex the stack, the more brittle it could be. Any given dependency could fail in certain ways. Therefore, you might lean towards less complex software. But that might also mean that those software have not always been tested against different use cases. So these are things you will have to figure out for any given software tool. How do the developers validate their software? Uh, are there dependency changes since it was last validated? I gave the example of a publication from 2009 that gets cited over and over again as to why somebody chose to use that software. It turns out that every single software validated in that publication has changed since 2009 and nobody has redone that comparative evaluation. Should I continue to cite that publication as why I use that software or redo that revalidation? Now, I can understand that this is a tall order and this will take time and community effort rather than a solitary individual effort to understand all of these pieces. But there are things you can do about your own analyses. You can perform testing on your scripts, rerun the analyses or pieces of it if feasible. Try to determine sensitive parameters or algorithms that have the biggest impact on outcome. This is something we call vibration or parametric testing. And it's helpful to know how varied the outcomes are. If your distributions are still narrow and on point, that's a good thing. That, you, that means you know that independent of the tools being used, I have a robust finding. And as an exercise, you can run and evaluate your scripts on data you did not collect. How robustly did I write my script so that it runs on other data sets? And especially if they're similar data sets, you could even evaluate how similar the result is to the result you were expecting from your own data. But a bigger question you might want to ask is how do you validate your results? At a simple level, you might implement a regression test. That means, have my results changed as I added the last five subjects that I collected last week in relation to what the results were prior to those five subjects? Have my results changed as I changed my software dependencies of the script that I run? FSL just released a new version. Do I get the same results if I run it through this new version of FSL? And that's what's a regression test. And it allows you to see if your results have changed. Now, whether your results actually have meaningful impact on your scientific inference is a separate question. But a regression test is a basic first step to notify you whether there was a difference. Then you can evaluate how large that difference was and how it changes the outcome of your inference. Is there a basic test case that you, you can use in the absence of any ground truth for validation? Now we know through the history of brain imaging that there are certain things. If you showed people an on and off checkerboard pattern, you would expect to get a very robust signal in V1. If you have something like that, could it help you at least validate that every single person is showing a robust signal in V1? Finally, if you were building predictive models or even doing analysis where you have access to a large set of data, could you use something like bootstrapping or cross-validation to ensure that the distributions around your relationships that you're looking at as a result of your own analyses are somewhat narrow and tight? So here are some tools that help you in this establishment of automated testing. First of all, uh, a lot of our software now exists on GitHub or some other platform, and they integrate with these various continuous integration platforms that automatically run tests whenever you change your code. And that could be changing your list of dependencies, going from one version of software to another, or changing the code itself, the actual algorithm or the workflow or tool that you were using. And these tools help you to automate and retest. And you might want to do this on a smallish data set so that you can see what the impact of those changes are on some known quantity. For many neuroimaging tasks, it's not possible to run without having extensive resources online to run exhaustive testing. So you might want to do some of this testing locally on your computer or on your local high-performance computing cluster. Um, and PyTest is a Python tool that enables some of this testing to be wrapped around. Uh, we have been building as part of Repronym a tool called TestKraken and this allows you to evaluate uh, the impact of various operating systems and environments um, on some scientific outcome. What we're seeing over here is looking at uh, two operating systems and two versions of FSL 
relative to a Mac OS reference run. The highlighted column indicates success or failure based on a 5% or more in amygdala volume change relative to the reference data. And as we can see, just across these four different environments, we see some set of uh, participants who have failed this 5% change test across uh, FSL versions and operating systems. You have already been introduced to NeuroDocker. It's a tool that allows you to create these different environments. And in fact, TestKraken uses NeuroDocker under the hood to automatically create these different environments for testing. You've also gotten to hear about DataLad Run, which itself, just by running the same analysis again, will tell you if your results have changed because it will create new data that it stores into your version control data store. Now you might consider that you want to really look at improving trust in software. Well, one of the best ways to do so is use different software to do the same thing. If you get the same result, then you improve trust across all of those software. If you don't get the same result, you get to know when things break, when things don't work. And it's important to annotate these failures. It is important to know when some things fail and when they don't work and to report these failures, bugs, and unexpected outcomes on the software repos. It is a community effort in trying to get the software to do better and improving trust. All of these are open source tools. They've been written by graduate students, technical assistants, postdocs in various places. They don't often have a whole lot of robust software engineering, but as a community, many of these tools have come together to improve the software engineering, to improve the testing. So if you can do your part by reporting bugs and failures, that would really help in improving the quality of tools and software. You want to contribute to your use cases. If some tool does not support it, if you have the skills to write new software, contribute it to the software. If not, at least make your use case known so that other people know that these are things that should be addressed at some point. You want to automate validation and revalidation. We don't want to wait and cite a paper 10 years downstream. We want to be able to do that revalidation as underlying software changes. And today, a lot of that is possible through the tools and technologies we have. And finally, you want to know what a software is doing. So enable the software to track provenance, and that will improve trust in software because we will know what has been done using that software. And that really brings us to the last component over here, which is what is provenance? I've talked about the provenance word a fair bit. Um, why is provenance essential? And how do we track provenance? So let me start with two evaluations we did. On the left, the same software was used on different operating systems. And what we're looking at is the percentage of reference value of the volume of subcortical sub sub structures. And in the ideal word, world, this percentage difference should be zero. However, we can see clearly that these are non-zero values indicating that the same software on different operating systems gives you different values. On the right, we see the same group of participants run through different software and looking at a single subcortical volume from thalamus in this particular case across these different software. And as you can see, different software perform quite differently across the participants, which means they're not always robust across a given data set. They also give you slightly different values across these things. So knowing what, what value you're looking at and what software it came from is going to be important as you think about how to interpret and how to contextualize the scientific inference in the context of the software. But this is like looking at this cartoon. So on the left, the rock formation had an inscription where they were talking about the mystery of the Mayan calendar and it stops in 2012. And the person simply tells the person, I ran out of space on the rock. But somebody else looking at the same calendar says, how come this ends in 2012? And with that verbal provenance that's missing now, it's impossible for them to recover why it ends in 2012. And that's exactly the problem with provenance. We do a lot of things in science which are not recorded anywhere. Sometimes they're recorded in file names. But file names get destroyed, doesn't carry over from one person to another, and it would be impossible to recover provenance through the, file name, fi through the file names. So let's now figure out what is provenance. Provenance is information about entities, activities, and people involved in producing a piece of data or thing, which can be used to form assessments about its quality, reliability, or trustworthiness. 
Provenance records contain descriptions of the entities and activities involved in producing and delivering or otherwise influencing a given object. And one can look at provenance again through that lens of input, activity, and output. We can look at agent-centered provenance, which is the kinds of uh, people or software that were involved with either the inputs or the activity. Object-centered provenance, the inputs or outputs that were produced by an activity or process-centered provenance, which is the activity itself. And this is exactly what the NIDM model, which you've heard about, is based on. It's trying to describe the different kinds of inputs and outputs generated through the chain of neuroimaging analyses and make them concretely represented using this provenance model. So why is provenance essential? Well, first and foremost, it's to improve trust. But you can also use it to inspect quality of analyses, because you might know certain things about which tool might be robust or not robust. Uh, you can find information about analyses, find the software used, query the parameters of any step, review and verify the intent of each step. People may have done different things along the chain of some of our complex scientific workflows. You might use provenance to repeat analyses on similar data or reuse part of the analyses. And finally, having provenance records allows you to discover related analyses. In that paper we saw earlier, uh, ants and FreeSurfer were used to predict age and gender in a cohort. You might find that in some other part of the provenance graph, Somebody else did similar analyses, but used some other tools to do so, or some other data sets to do so. And finally, you can use provenance to generate diffs between two analyses. And this is the kind of thing that, again, uh, would be possible only if you tracked provenance in your own work. So if we think about this model of inputs, activity, and output, one of the easiest ways to track provenance is to take notes whenever possible. You can add comments to your scripts and code. You can version your code with appropriate commits uh, in a Git repository. You can capture your interaction logs on a terminal, capture history. Even though this is not structured provenance, it provides some way of capturing what you did. Finally, even better, use version control systems like Data Lab. It may be a little complex when you start, but once you get the hang of it, it will simplify all of this and automate many of these processes that we've talked about today. You can also use software that itself track provenance. Uh, you can save terminal or other output logs from software. Many software today do a fair amount of logging, and that's useful to keep in mind and keep around. It's just hard to parse through. Many software perform structured logging, which means you can use other tools to parse through that software. And finally, if you are writing your own software, it's important that you might consider provenance tracking or integrating provenance tracking into your scripts and software. So what we've looked at over the last 45 to 50 minutes or so are different factors that influence computational reproducibility. Computational flexibility, data flow tools, provenance, software changes. But we should not forget about data. And encoding data in standardized form is as important as all of these computational tools in thinking about reproducibility. The variability we get from data in many cases is going to be much larger than any of these other factors. But you want to dissociate the variability from one factor versus another. And finally, as we are getting to a future world of integrated systems where we have closed loop systems that might measure, that might predict, that might create interventions or adjustments, the complexity associated with future scientific experiments is only going to grow. And even more important to standardize, annotate, track provenance, and improve the scalability and reproducibility of your analytics. So I'm gonna leave you with five principles for doing reproducible analyses and a set of automation technologies, some of which you have already covered. But here are the principles. You want to explore as many analytic variants as you can. This will help you discover when things fail and how generalizable your results are. But do not choose the best one, show all. Till the field harmonizes on what might be the best approaches, it's important that we understand the variability from different approaches. Before you create your own workflows, reuse existing ones. That's going to help you do more reproducible analyses. Uh, do not recreate unless you have a good, really good reason to. There's a lot of knowledge that goes into some of the workflows that are being produced today. And therefore, being able to reuse, whether it's the HCP minimal pre-processing pipeline or fMRI prep or DMRI prep or QSI prep, you get a lot of benefit by standing on the experience of people who have been looking at the robustness of these workflows across different data sets. You want to think about automating your workflow and version and share your analytic tools and scripts. Reproducibility means we can repeat things. And one of the biggest hindrances to repeating things is when you cannot automate. Therefore, you want to make sure you want to identify as many of the bottlenecks to automation as possible and remove it. 
You want to share the outputs of your analytic tools with provenance about versions of software, operating systems, data sets, etc. If you did not have to run a computation and you could simply reuse the output of somebody else's, that would make things a lot more reproducible because you start off at a different point. And if there was a bug in the earlier process, when somebody else runs that process, we would find it and we would replicate those issues. The ABCD dataset that you are playing with has a lot of derivatives that it has already run through careful quality control and processing. By making those derivatives available, you're able to reproduce things much more easily because now you have reduced a significant chunk of computation that has gone on to create those derivatives. Finally, for any scientific workflow, it's important to understand the details of your inputs and to determine how you would validate your output. In the absence of ground truth, it might be something like saying, I will run this test, and if it's within this tolerance, then I know my results are similar. But it's something that you would want to do. So hopefully, you now have a set of concepts that you can apply to your own work. In terms of the tools and technologies, you will get to play with many of these things through data exercises in this course. Many of the tools will require time and effort to learn more about. Uh, feel free to reach out when, if you have any questions, and we'll see you in the Q&A session next week.